Part 2, Chapter 4 The New Path Ethan and Sven packed their luggage in silence, each in their own corner of the room. With every item they stowed away, the weight of their decisions pressed upon them, a somber collection of reminders, yet these were choices they would willingly make again, a thousandfold. Minutes ticked by, and once every belonging was accounted for, Ethan approached his desk. There lay his umbrella, an innocuous ally in the midst of turmoil. As he picked it up, his gaze lingered on it, his grip tightening around the handle, a silent battle waged within. Yet, he soon relaxed his hold, recognizing the futility of succumbing to a storm of emotions once more. Ethan, Sven's voice cut through the silence. Ethan paused. What is it, Sven? Are you truly going to comply with their demands? Do you intend to enlist? What choice do I have, Sven? I thought you, of all people, would understand. I'm cornered. Sven hesitated. I. I've decided to return to my mother's side. She's had been living with her side of the family ever since my father divorced her. If you want. I could take you with me. Ethan regarded Sven with a complexity of emotions. Their history was a tapestry of conflict. Initially, there was only animosity, but with time, understanding, and a mutual respect had blossomed between them. Ethan felt a shift in his own demeanor, a softening perhaps. Sven was still young, and Ethan knew too well how the fires of youth could refine a person's character. Maybe I've been too harsh on him, he mused. It was true, children adapted quickly, their behaviors and identities shaped by their encounters and environments. Ethan pondered if his influence had played a role in Sven's transformation during their time at the academy. Yet, beyond personal growth, there was a deeper bond. Shared tragedies had drawn them closer, both had lost fathers, homes, and both sought refuge from the chaos surrounding them. Their fates, it seemed, were intertwined by the need to find solace in a world that had taken so much from them. Ethan's face softened, and a wry smile, one that had become a stranger to him amidst the cascade of misfortunes, tugged at the corners of his mouth. Thank you, Sven, for considering me. But as you've heard, I lack the privilege of choice. My birthrights does not offer me paths, but rather they were dictated from the start. Military service isn't an option, it's an edict. The academy was my only refuge, and even that has slipped through my fingers. His smile held a touch of sadness, reflecting the harsh realities that had befallen them both, yet also acknowledging the gesture of solidarity from his unlikely comrade. Ethan. Knock, knock. Ethan, Sven. Have you finished packing your luggage? It's time to go. Alfred's voice, steady and imbued with a certain solemnity, filtered through the door. Ethan glanced at Sven, his eyes reflecting gratitude for the few who offered him solace in this lonely world. Let's go. Ethan said as they moved to join Alfred, stepping into the uncertain future that awaited them. Yeah. Beyond the door, Alfred and Seraphine waited. As Ethan glimpsed Seraphine, he noticed a shift from her usual demeanor. Her head was bowed, strands of her hair veiling her face. It was clear to Ethan and Sven that the news of their imminent departure and the calamity that had struck their homes had cast a shadow over her spirit. Did a tinge of sadness for their plight color her mood? Could she be harboring resentment for being kept in the dark until now? Or perhaps there was a hint of resentment at not being approached for help in their hour of need. Follow me. Alfred instructed with a tone that brokered no delay. Ethan and Sven began to trail behind him, the rhythmic sound of their footsteps in stark contrast to Seraphine's stillness. She remained rooted to the spot, her stillness growing more pronounced against their movement. Sven's head turned back intermittently, his eyes seeking Seraphine, contemplating whether a parting word was needed. Yet Ethan, resolute in his silence, did not share this hesitation. In Ethan's eyes, the world's harshness was a reality made starker by the social chasms that divided them. Seraphine was atop a hierarchy that towered above even the nobility within the academy's walls had compromised her standing by mingling with them. And now, as their paths diverged, Ethan deemed it best to leave things be. They had shared a camaraderie, yes, but to drag her into the mess of his predicaments would serve neither of them. 
In his mind, it was an unspoken act of care to leave her unaffected to the weight of their troubles. Seraphine's voice was a whisper, a wisp of sound barely escaping her lips. W, W, wait. Again, a bit louder but still a murmur, wait. Her questions, laced with silent desperation, sought the air around her. Why? Why didn't you ask for my help? My mother, she could have done something. Why didn't you think to reach out to me? But her soft pleas were lost, muffled, and indecipherable to anyone but herself. Wait. Finally, her restraint shattered, her voice pealed out, commanding and desperate. But it was too late. When she turned around, she was met with nothing but the echo of her own cry. Her delay, longer than she realized, had cost her the chance to be heard. The trio had already departed from the premises, leaving her anchored to her spot, alone. Her typically cool composure had melted away, leaving behind a raw, desperate plea for connection that went unheard. The trio stepped out of the academy to find two carriages awaiting them. One was shabby and bore more resemblance to a cage than a comfortable means of travel. Two armored soldiers flanked the entrance of this forbidding vehicle, their stance suggesting they were anticipating the transfer of a prisoner rather than a passenger. In stark contrast, the other carriage was inviting, showcasing a well-crafted wooden structure adorned with a blue banner that featured intricate designs on its roof. A retinue of armed guards was arrayed in front, with a few butlers standing by, signaling readiness and a higher regard for whoever was to be their occupant. Ethan cast his gaze upon the two disparate carriages, fully aware of the starkly different paths they represented and which one he was destined to board. Sven, being a member of the Viscar family, your mother has been notified of the circumstances. She has sent transportation for you, Alfred stated, his voice carrying the weight of authority, but there was a hint of reluctance in the role he had been assigned. Per the Academy's orders, I must ask you to depart immediately. His demeanor reflected the gravity of the situation, yet it was clear he felt conflicted about enforcing the abrupt separation. Sven acknowledged the situation with a nod, the weight of the moment pressing upon him. Yet, there was a resolve in his eyes that hadn't been there before. He paused, turning to Ethan, and his voice carried a newfound determination. Ethan, I refuse to just accept how things are. I'm going to rebuild Thornfield, right from the ashes. Sven declared, his resolve stealing him. So, you have to survive. Make it through, because when Thornfield stands tall again, you'll have a home to come back to, a place that's truly yours. It might take years, maybe even decades, but I'll make it happen. And don't think I'm going to be coddled at my mother's side. I'm going to grow stronger, gain power and authority, until I can rebuild everything we've lost. His words weren't just a promise to Ethan, they were a vow to himself, a commitment to a future that he intended to forge with his own hands. Home, he says. A wry smile tugged at Ethan's lips, his heart lightened by Sven's ambitious vow. In a silent show of solidarity and acknowledgement, he extended his hand, a gesture that carried a weight of meaning far beyond the simple act. For Sven, this was more than just an affirmation, it was the beginning of a renewed sense of purpose, the dawn of an aspirational goal, and above all, the birth of a friendship that had been forged in the fires of a new start. Sven reached out, clasping Ethan's hand firmly. The unspoken pledge of support between them. For a moment, the world around them, the impending journey, the grim carriages, the soldiers, faded into the background. With this simple exchange, their paths diverged. Sven turned, shoulders set, towards the carriage that would take him to the safety and comfort of his mother's care, a world away from the uncertain fate that awaited Ethan. Ethan, meanwhile, faced the less inviting transport, the cage-like carriage meant for him, with a quiet courage. Ethan, wait, Alfred called out, his voice firm yet tinged with a warmth that belied his usually stoic demeanor. Ethan paused, turning back with an inquisitive look. What is it, Mr. Alfred? Alfred extended his hand, revealing an item that seemed to carry significant weight, not in heft, but in meaning. Seeing the object, a burst of laughter escaped Ethan, surprising even himself. Ha! Ha ha ha! This feels like deja vu, Mr. Alfred, he remarked, 
recognizing the significance of the familiar token. Ethan, you have consistently surpassed my expectations, Alfred said, his voice laced with a rare blend of affection and respect. You might be facing some of the darkest times of your life, but my instincts tell me you are more than what you seem. More than what this world has seen. Take this, and let it help you carve out your rightful place in this often unjust world. Ethan's eyes softened, a sincere gratitude washing over him. Thank you, Mr. Alfred. Since the beginning, you've been my biggest ally. And even now, at this crossroad, you haven't given up on me. Thank you. His words were earnest, conveying a depth of appreciation for the unwavering support Alfred had provided. Grasping the item, Ethan turned away from Alfred, the academy, and the life he had known, stepping into the austere carriage that awaited him. The door closed with a resounding thud, a symbolic end to one chapter and the uncertain beginning of another, underpinned by the belief that Alfred had in Ethan's potential to rise above his current station. The sound of the soldiers commanding Ha jerked the carriage into motion, the familiar silhouette of the academy receding into the distance. Ethan sat back against the hard seat, the rattle and jostle of the carriage hurtling away from his past. He lowered his head, attention captured by the item he held. Glad I get the chance to continue my studies. A book, the title emblazoned across the cover in an H script, Introduction to Magic Theory 2. Part 2, Chapter 5 Magic Counterpart in the heart of the Imperial Kingdom of Caladora's territory, a fierce battle unfolded on the outskirts of a small, isolated village. The kingdom's army, a thousand strong, stood resolute against a formidable incursion. Bound by duty to uphold the kingdom's commands, the soldiers faced a lethal threat, an onslaught of creatures that bore a haunting resemblance to arachnids, with glistening crimson eyes whom numbered was close to their own. These monstrous beings had already laid waste to an entire settlement, leaving devastation in their wake. However, this time, the kingdom had been informed of their advancement and made preparations to confront and eradicate the menace before they could lay waste to another village. The air was thick with the sounds of clashing steel and the war cries of men. Soldiers in heavy armor pushed back against the swarm of creatures, their swords slicing through the air with lethal intent. The battle was a test of endurance and metal, as the soldiers fought not just for victory but for the survival of their kingdom's borders and their own. Meanwhile, the villagers, whose lives and homes were at stake, huddled together, praying for the safety of their homes. Their eyes were filled with fear and hope, witnessing the relentless bravery of the kingdom's army. Each soldier's strike was a beacon of resistance against the encroaching darkness brought forth by these nightmarish invaders. At the entrance of the village, as the battle raged just beyond its gates, a frail old man approached a figure who seemed to embody the very essence of valor and strength. This towering individual was resplendent in his silver-blue armor, which was adorned with intricate designs. His hair, bearing the dignified touch of time, with streaks of silver that matched his armor. A well-groomed beard framed a strong jaw, hinting at countless days spent in the wilds, facing down beasts and others alike. Yet, it was his eyes, steely blue and sharp as a hawk's gaze, that spoke of his unwavering resolve and wisdom gleaned from his countless battles. In his gauntlet-clad hand, he held a sword that was as wide as himself, pointing at the heavens and seemed to hum with the very essence of valor, a sign that here walked a man who pledged his blade to the protection of the realm. The elder, clad in cloth that set him apart from the other villagers, halted before Sir Aldric, the esteemed knight. Sir Aldric, I implore you, shield us from those horrors, the village lord pleaded, his voice a mixture of fear and hope. I do not wish for my home to befell the same fate as Thornfield. The memory of Thornfield's fate, a testament to the cruelty that awaited them should their defenses fail, loomed heavy in the air. Be at ease. Sir Aldric responded, his voice resonant with the authority and dignity befitting his rank. The well-being of this village and its people, under the aegis of my sword, shall never be endangered. As long as I draw breath, not a single adversary shall breach our defenses. In the presence of such resolute assurance, the village lord's worry seemed to lessen. Sir Aldric had spoken not just as a warrior, but as the lord commander, the highest-ranking officer of knight order within the kingdom. 
Sir Aldric surveyed the battlefield with a practiced eye, zeroing in on the source of the chaos. Among the swarm of enemy creatures, one stood out, a disgusting beast that seemed to be giving orders, a general in an army of nightmares. The fall of Lord Van of Thornfield, a master mage of renowned lineage, spoke volumes to the formidable and fearsome foe. A creature whose might rivaled the most dreaded dark creatures within their ranks. He understood then that the creature before him was no mere strangler, but a force that could very well be an A-ranked abomination. Such adversaries were usually cut down not by brute force alone, but by strategy, by cunning, and by the collective strength of the few who could match it. Sir Aldrich stood firm, an imposing figure against the backdrop of battlefield. Unlike the common mage whose power lay in incantations and spells, Sir Aldrich belonged to the rare breed of Aura user, warriors who could channel the raw essence of life itself, known as Aura, into physical might that goes beyond the conventional magic that mages manifests. The path of Aura is arguably the most demanding discipline, serving as a testament to a warrior's resolute dedication to their life's calling. It is often said that those who succeed in manifesting their aura are individuals who have stared death in the face countless times, to many times to count, yet have never faltered in its presence. For these warriors, the aura is not just a mark of honor, it is their lifeblood, the very essence of their being, fueling an extraordinary prowess that sets them apart from all others. The ranks of these exceptional warriors are hardly any, making them the rarest among the extraordinary, fewer in number than mages, by a large margin. Yet, some says that in the hardship of combat, their formidable capabilities far eclipse those of their magical counterparts. Sir Aldrich was one of those rare individuals who truly lived up to his reputation. To say he was the strongest knight in the kingdom of Caladora would be an understatement. He served as the king's right hand and the defender of the people. Tasked with eliminating a new threat to the kingdom, Sir Aldrich took up the challenge without hesitation. As he stepped forward to confront the danger, the soldiers around him couldn't help but smile with respect behind their bloodstained helmets. They made room for him, shoving the monsters aside to let their leader through. With every step, Sir Aldrich was focused on his mission to confront and defeat the enemy that threatened his lord. His gaze locked onto the monstrosity orchestrating the onslaught. A creature of a rank menace. Yet, the fear that might have gripped a lesser warrior's heart was absent in Sir Aldrich's. Instead, there was a flame of resolve, a determination that spoke of battles endured and victories hard won. The battlefield, for a moment, seemed to hold its breath. Sir Aldrich, the embodiment of might and resolve, became a streak across the sky, his movement a blur to the untrained eyes. His great sword, an extension of his fierceness, shone with an intensity that cut through the advancing darkness. As he closed the distance between him and the monstrous creature, the aura around him condensed, visible now in its intensity, a testament to his ferocious energy that threatened destruction to any foe it graced. The dark creature, sensing the impending threat, let out a bellowing screech that shook the earth and rattled the bones of all who heard it. But Sir Aldric did not waver. His strike was a culmination of years of training, a perfect fusion of human strength and the raw power of aura manifestation. The sword came down with the weight of countless battles and the force of an unwavering wall, aimed carefully at the head of the vile creature that dared to bring ruin upon the land of his king. The creature, with a terrifying display of agility, unfurled insect-like wings that had been concealed beneath its carapace. The wings beat the air with violent force, propelling the beast upwards just as Sir Aldrich's sword sought to cleave it in half. It was the same maneuver that had spelled doom for Lord Van of Thornfield, the sudden burst of speed, the abrupt ascent, only this time, Sir Aldrich was no mere bystander to its deadly dance. The knight, eyes narrowed, registered the evasion with a warrior's keenness and experience. He had anticipated this might not be a simple battle of strength against strength. As the creature hovered, levitating with an unnatural grace, it took a moment to locate its attacker. The realization dawned upon it like a second strike. Sir Aldrich was no longer on the ground. The knight, with the adaptability of a seasoned predator, launching himself into the air in pursuit, tracing a gleaming arc of silver against the backdrop of the sun. The creature could feel the essence of bloodlust from above. 
As the creature looked up, it was met with the sight of Sir Aldred bearing down from above, his great sword once again poised for a death blow. You cannot escape me, vile creature. Ha! The creature, driven by instinctual survival and the cunning that had made it a leader among its kin, narrowly evaded the edge of Sir Aldric's sword, the metal singing through the air, a whisker away from its mark. Twice now his strikes had missed, yet Sir Aldric's resolve remained unshaken. He recognized the creature's cunning, its capacity for adaptation, a foe far more formidable than the common horrors it led. This knowledge only steeled the knight's determination, for he knew that such a beast would die the moment his sword pierced its grotesque body. How long will you be able to evade, I wonder? Sir Aldric called out, his voice steady. A provocation to the creature, hinting that the dance of their battle was far from over. Part 2 Chapter 6 Sir Aldric's Duel Against the Nightmare The hard-pressed village within Caladora was a loud stage, upon which a battle of large proportions unfolded. The clash of steel and the cries of warriors formed a grim echo throughout. But within, in the expanse of the open field, a duel of fates was being written, a night against the nightmare. Sir Aldric, Lord Commander of the Night Order, clashed once more with the monstrous entity that had brought ruin to Thornfield Village. Their dance was a whirlwind of motion, a battle of strength, agility, and stamina. As the creature, with its grotesque wings, hovered in the air, its crimson eyes bore into Sir Aldric. It had underestimated this human, this warrior who defied the limits of ordinary men. The beast's mind, though driven by primal instincts, recognized the threat that Aldric posed. Sir Aldric, his great sword gripped tightly, watched the creature with the focus of an eagle. Strategy and cunning were tools for others. Sir Aldric's path to his revered status as Lord Commander was carved through sheer force and an unwavering will to overcome any challenge. He was a warrior in the truest sense, believing in meeting strength with greater strength, facing each adversary head-on, and triumphing through sheer power and resilience. In each clash of his great sword, and every move he made, this philosophy was evident. Sir Aldric had faced countless foes, each more daunting than the last, yet he had always emerged victorious. To him, this duel was another testament to his unbreakable spirit, another battle to be won by overpowering the enemy. As the creature charged, Sir Aldric braced himself. His muscles tensed, and his great sword held as similarly to that of a shield. In his understanding of combat, victory was a straightforward equation, meet force with greater force, and never yield. The creature of nightmare was fast and cunning, but Sir Aldric had faced such traits before. Yet, it wasn't something he couldn't or haven't overcome. Sir Aldric, the embodiment of martial prowess, engaged the nightmarish creature in a breathtaking duel. Their styles were a study in contrasts, a testament to the diverse forms of strength that inhabited this world. Every arc of his blade carried the ferocity of a storm, effortlessly slicing through the most robust armor and the densest hide. While his technique forego the delicate artistry of a duelist, it compensated with overwhelming power. This was a style born not of elegance, but of a singular, unshakable purpose, to purge the realm of the malevolent demons that plagued it. The air whooshed and hummed with every swing, creating sonic booms that reverberated across the battlefield. The creature, on the other hand, moved with a grace that belied its grotesque form. Its attacks were lightning fast, a flurry of claws that sought to tear and rend. Its wings, battered yet powerful, whipped up gales that disrupted Sir Aldric's rhythm, its eyes seemed to anticipate his every move. Sir Aldric, soaring upward on a current of his own aura, brought his sword down in a mighty curve, aiming to split the creature in two. The beast, twisted in the air, evading the strike by mere inches. Its counter was a vicious swipe of its clawed limb, aimed at Sir Aldric's head. But the knight, in a display of agility that belied his armor's bulk, tilted to the side, turning a potentially lethal blow into a glancing scrape. Your speed won't save you. Sir Aldric shouted as he narrowly dodged. Sir Aldric, undeterred by the creature's speed, pressed on, his every strike requiring the beast to expend energy to dodge or parry. He was like a relentless tide, each wave crashing harder than the last. 
As the creature circled back for another attack, it let out a series of hisses and clicks, an eerie form of communication that sent chills down the spines of the onlookers. I have faced darkness before and prevailed. You are but another to be vanquished. His voice carried not just defiance, but an unwavering conviction that resonated with the soldiers below. In a breathtaking display of aerial acrobatics, the creature circled around, launching a volley of attacks. Sir Aldrich, eyes locked on the incoming assault, swung his greatsword with unmatched speed, deflecting the creature's sharp claws. Sparks flew as steel met the creature's hard skeletal hands, each deflection a close call that could have meant death. The knight, seizing the moment, unleashed a burst of aura that shimmered brilliantly, captivating the awestruck onlookers. His sword, infused with the vibrant energy of his aura, was brandished with such formidable strength that it seemed entirely plausible for the sheer force of his strike to cleave a mountain in half. The air around them crackled with the energy of their battle, a physical manifestation of the struggle between light and darkness. Below, the onlookers could hardly believe the spectacle. It was as if they were witnessing a legend come to life, a tale of heroism and monster slaying that they would pass down through the ages. With each exchange, with each near miss and direct hit, the tension escalated. Sir Aldrich, armor scarred and dented from the battle, refused to yield. The creature, its hide marred by the knight's sword, became increasingly desperate. Then, in a moment of mishap, an opening appeared. The beast, in its haste, left itself vulnerable for a split moment. Sir Aldric, with the keen eye of a seasoned warrior, saw his chance. With a mighty roar, he channeled all his strength and aura into one final, decisive blow. Time seemed to slow as the great sword descended with a silver streak aimed at the evil's heart. The creature, realizing its error too late, could only watch as the blade approached about to strike true. Just as Sir Aldrich's sword was poised to deliver the decisive blow, a sudden, unexpected intervention occurred. From the corners of the battlefield, the smaller creatures, the minions of the larger beast, swarmed in a frenzied rush toward their leader. In a sacrificial act driven by either instinct or some dark command, they interposed themselves between Sir Aldrich's descending blade and their leader. The great sword, glowing with the combined might of strength and aura, met this living shield with a thunderous crash. The impact was monumental, sending shockwaves through the air. The smaller creatures bore the brunt of the strike, their bodies acting as a barrier to protect the monstrous entity they served. Curse it! Sir Aldred bellowed, his frustration echoing over the din of battle as his blade was arrested by the mass of bodies shielding the beast. Sir Aldric, taken aback by this sudden turn, grunted with the effort of the strike. His blade, though powerful, was halted by the mass of bodies that now clung to it. The creature's sacrifice bought their leader precious seconds, enough time for it to regain its composure and land its own decisive strike. In a sudden and treacherous move, the creature exploited the distraction. Like a viper striking from the shadows, its sharp claws emerged with lethal precision from behind the protective wall of its underlings. Sir Aldric, caught off guard, had only a split second to react. Watch out, Sir Aldric, one of his men shouted from below, but it was too late. The creature's claws, razor sharp and unyielding, pierced through the air and found their mark. With a brutal force, they penetrated Sir Aldric's armor, leaving a gaping wound in his right thigh. The pain was immediate and searing. Agar. Sir Aldric grunted in pain, his focus momentarily faltering. The intensity of the blow forced him to retreat a few paces back, his grip on his sword tightening as he laid the edge to the ground as foot hold to maintain his balance and composure. Tricky beast. Sir Aldric growled, pain and anger mixing in his voice. Blood began to seep through the rent in his armor, staining the metal and dripping down his leg. The injury was serious, a hindrance that could prove fatal in the dance of death he was engaged in. The wound Sir Aldric sustained was not just a physical impediment, it was a strategic disadvantage. In a battle where every fraction of a second counted, where the battle hinged on swiftness and agility, such a wound was a dire setback. The creature, embodying the essence of speed and agility, would undoubtedly capitalize on this new weakness. Sir Aldric understood this all too well. 
His usual strategy of overwhelming force now had to be tempered with caution. Gritting his teeth, Sir Aldred recalibrated his stance, adjusting to the wound's throbbing pain. Despite the searing pain and the looming threat of the creature exploiting his injury, Sir Aldrich's resolve did not waver. He knew that yielding to despair or allowing fear to take hold would only hasten his defeat. The lives of his men and the safety of the village rested on his shoulders. Focus, Sir Aldrich muttered to himself, steeling his mind against the pain. Every move must count. Part 2, Chapter 7, The Unyielding Night the atmosphere crackled with palpable tension. Despite his injury, Sir Aldrich stood resolute, his grip on the greatsword unwavering, as solid as the moment he first wielded it. Pain radiated from the wound in his thigh, a sharp, throbbing reminder of the battle stakes, as blood began to seep out and overflow. The creature eyed Sir Aldrich with a sneering, mocking gaze, reveling in the deceit that had ensnared the knight. Empowered by the shift in the tide of battle to its favor, the creature's confidence grew bolder. With a sudden burst of speed, it lunged through the air with increased ferocity. With a deep breath, the knight centered himself. He delved into the uncharted depths of his aura, tapping into a power that exceeded his usual limits. Cornered, with few options left, he understood the necessity of playing every card in his hand. As raw energy surged through his veins, it fortified his limbs, enhancing his strength at the expense of his stamina. He knew he had to end this battle quickly, for the longer it dragged on, the more the scales tipped in favor of the creature. Not only did his aura encase his body, reinforcing his limbs, but it also enveloped his great sword, which emitted an overwhelming pressure. The blade, now aglow with the radiance of his aura, sliced through the air with a terrifying speed that eclipsed his earlier demonstration, even before his injury. This display of raw power was a clear indication of his attitude to expend every ounce of his stamina and aura reserves in a gamble to quickly conclude the battle. The creature, taken aback by Sir Aldrich's sudden and intense oppression, scrambled to evade. In a desperate move, it released a series of sharp, ear-piercing shrieks, summoning its kin to the fray. The battlefield rapidly transformed into a tumultuous maelstrom of chaos as smaller creatures swarmed to their leader's aid. Amidst this escalating turmoil, Sir Aldrich maintained his formidable stance. He held his sword steady, focusing the swirling aura around the blade for a singular, decisive strike. The smaller creatures lunged at him, intent on overwhelming and halting his advance. However, the knight allowed them to approach, confident in himself. The sheer pressure of his aura and the blistering speed of his advance created a formidable barrier. Most of the creatures were deflected away, unable to latch onto him due to the intense aura and the pressure of his rapid movement. Undaunted by the increasing number of adversaries, remained singularly focused on his goal, poised to strike a decisive blow. In mere seconds, the two opponents closed the distance between them, each intent on delivering the final blow. Ha, Fu. With a quiet, focused exhalation, he concentrated his efforts on the creature. The beast unleashed a relentless onslaught, its claws a whirlwind of deadly maneuvers, equally determined to conclude the conflict. Yet, Leveraging his extensive experience as a warrior, anticipated encountered each of the creature's ferocious strikes. His heightened combat prowess was further enhanced by the application of his aura to his eyes, augmenting his visual acuity with unparalleled precision. Every fiber of his being, now fully consumed by his aura, was set on ending the confrontation. As they clashed, a spectacular burst of light and shadow enveloped them. The creature, driven by primal survival instincts, unleashed its most formidable attack. Dark energy swirled around it, as if it too possessed an aura of its own, a malevolent miasma that threatened to swallow him whole. But the knight, his resolve unyielding as steel, cut through the darkness with his radiant aura. The light emanating from him shone like a beacon, dispelling the creature's dark miasma. His aura illuminated the battlefield, casting a warm, reassuring glow that bolstered the spirits of the soldiers and villagers. In this moment, Sir Aldrich stood not just as a warrior, but as a symbol of hope, his indomitable will shining brightly amidst the chaos of battle. Surrounded by the radiant glow of his aura, raised his greatsword high. The tension in the air was palpable, a tangible force that seemed to pause time itself. 
Every eye on the battlefield was fixed on this pivotal moment, the culmination of a fierce and desperate struggle. The creature, sensing the impending strike, roared defiantly, its own dark energy pulsating violently in response. But with his focus unwavering, cut through the chaos. In a split second, the world seemed to hold its breath. His sword descended with a force that was both majestic and terrifying. The blade, a streak of brilliant light, cut through the air, moving with such speed and power that it seemed to tear the very fabric of the battlefield. As the sword met the creature, there was a moment of surreal silence, a brief suspension of reality before the impact registered. Then, in an explosion of light and energy, the creature's dark aura shattered. Boom! A shockwave rippled through the air as the creature's body convulsed, then went still. The creature, unable to withstand the power of Sir Aldric's aura-infused sword, met its end. The once menacing eyes dimmed, and the monstrous form began to split itself in half, thumbling down the air as it fell toward the ground. Thumb X2 Silence fell over the battlefield, broken only by the ragged breaths of the weary soldiers. Sir Aldric, his armor stained with blood, stood tall amidst the remnants of the battle. His sword, still aglow with aura, was raised high signaling his victory. Ah! The soldiers of Caladora erupted in cheers, their voices a chorus of relief and triumph. They had witnessed a legend at work. The Lord Commander of the Night Order had not only saved the village, but also reaffirmed the unbreakable spirit of their kingdom. As the cheers echoed around him, he sheathed his sword, his gaze sweeping across the battlefield. The euphoria of his monumental victory was swiftly replaced by his commanding voice, resonating across the battlefield with clarity and authority. The battle has not ended. Focus, soldiers. The remnants are still rampaging in this battlefield. Get rid of them. For the kingdom. His words, like a sharp call, jolted the soldiers and villagers out of their momentary lapse into celebration. They quickly realigned their focus, reminded that the threat was not entirely quelled. The lesser creatures, leaderless but still dangerous, continued to wreak havoc. Instilled with renewed vigor from his rallying cry, the soldiers regrouped, their weapons ready. They moved with purpose, their determination reignited. The villagers, too, bolstered by the knight's bravery, lent their support, aiding the wounded. Together, united under their commander's leadership, they pressed forward. The remnants of the enemy, disorganized and demoralized by the loss of their leader, gradually succumbed to the coordinated efforts of the kingdom's defenders. As the tumult of battle continued in the distance, Sir Aldric, now somewhat removed from the immediate fray, eased himself into a chair at the camp. His posture, though weary, retained the dignity of a battle-hardened knight. An attendant rushed to his side, medical supplies in hand, ready to tend to his wounds. How are you feeling, commander? inquired another attendant, concern evident in their tone. I'll be fine. Aldric replied, a trace of exhaustion in his voice. I just need to rest for a few days. It has been quite some time since I last exhorted myself this far. Send a letter to the kingdom, informing them that the threat has been neutralized. By day's end, we should have dealt with most remnants of darkness in this area, and we can make our return to the kingdom. Understood. Ah, uh, I almost forgot, the attendant added quickly. A carrion bird brought a letter addressed to you. Huh? Does the kingdom have another mission for me? Aldric asked, a hint of surprise in his voice. No, sir. This message is from the Imperial Academy, Lyria, the attendant clarified. The mage's school? If it's from there, then it must be from my good friend Alfred. I haven't heard from him in years. This must be quite urgent for him to reach out to me. Hand me the letter. He requested, his interest piqued. The attendant handed over the letter, while the knight took it carefully, his fingers brushing over the seal of the Imperial Academy. The emblem, familiar yet distant, evoked memories of a time long past. As he broke the seal and unfolded the letter, Aldrich couldn't help but wonder what urgent message his old friend had sent, breaking years of silence. Aldrich's eyes scanned the contents of the letter, absorbing each word with curiosity. 
As he reached the end of the message, a small smirk played on his lips, a rare display of amusement for the typically stoic knight. Ethan Hartfield, interesting. He mused aloud, his voice tinged with intrigue. Part 2, Chapter 8 Gregory In the subdued glow of a dimly lit room, where candles were sparingly placed casting long, flickering shadows, an individual sat while being engrossed in documents strewn across his desk. As though he had foreseen the interruption, the man closed the book he was browsing and gently pushed it aside. Just as he did so, a rhythmic knock echoed from the door, a distinct sound that pierced the quietude separating his private chamber from the outside. Knock, knock. The deliberate rhythmic sound of the knocking suggested a visitor who was familiar yet respectful of its occupant. The man at the desk, seemingly anticipating this moment, remained calm and collected, his focus shifting seamlessly from the parchment before him to the door. With an air of authority, he called out, Enter. Upon receiving permission, two men entered the room. The first was clad in dark clothing from head to toe, almost as if he were deliberately trying to blend into the shadows, his presence meant to be unnoticed. In stark contrast, the second man, trailing just behind the first, had a much more conspicuous presence. He exuded an air of significance that made it impossible for him to fade into the background. Even if he had wished to, his demeanor and appearance were such that he naturally drew the attention of those around him, marking him as someone of note. The man who followed was a towering figure, standing at an imposing height of seven feet. His stature was so immense that he had to lower his head to pass through the doorway. His physique was equally remarkable, even draped in a black robe, the fabric did little to conceal the sheer bulk of his muscular build. His arms alone were so robust that each could be compared to the torso of an average adult man. Adorning his visage was a full beard and mustache, complemented by a buzz cut of brown hair. However, what truly set him apart and commanded attention wasn't just his extraordinary size, which in itself was a formidable presence. It was the prominent scar that ran across his head, down to his neck. This scar gave him a battle-hardened appearance. It drew the eyes of anyone who beheld him. I apologize for intruding at such late hours, Master Grandfeld, said the hooded man, his voice carrying a tone of deference as he kneeled down to pay respect to his leader. Mr. Gregory has arrived from his arduous journey. You damn old coot. You really outdid yourself this time, making me fetch such a thing. But I won't lie, even though it cost me a good number of my good men, it was a hell of a thrill these past few days, ha <laughs> ha. His laughter, loud and unapologetic, echoed through the room, a stark contrast to the more formal setting he was in. His demeanor was that of a man who was uninterested in the finer points of courtesy, instead favoring a more direct and raw approach to communication. His casual reference to the loss of his men, although seemingly insensitive, underscored the gritty and unglamorous reality of his line of work, hinting at a life accustomed to the brutalities of conflict and the weight of a leader. Council Elder Granfeld, maintaining a composed demeanor in the face of General Gregory's boisterousness, interjected with a measured tone, General Gregory, please quiet down. This isn't the moment or the place to be so loud. His words were a subtle reminder, aimed at keeping their meeting discreet and unnoticed. Bam! Suddenly, the door behind Gregory slammed shut with considerable force. It was not the result of someone physically closing it, as all individuals in the room remained stationary. Instead, an intimidating pressure seemed to emanate from Gregory himself. This invisible force was so potent that it physically pushed the door closed, causing the candle flames to flicker erratically in response to the wind pressure he exerted. Hey, old man. Since when have you become so brazen as to address me as a general? Gregory's voice dropped a hint of menace creeping in as his killing intent palpably reached Elder Granfeld. Gregory. Calm down, Gregory, mercenary commander of Minotaurus, Granfeld responded, his voice steady despite the tense atmosphere. My old age has taken a toll on my memories, and I may have carelessly blurred out your past position. Please, forgive my oversight. In this exchange, the tension between the two was evident, highlighting a complex relationship coexisted. Gregory, momentarily containing his anger, shifted his focus back to the matter at hand. Forget it. I'm here with the item you wanted. 
Job's done on my end. Now make sure you hold up your part of the bargain. Don't make me regret this, Grandfeld. You know what's at stake if things go south. And I don't need to tell you what I'm capable of if they do. His words, delivered with a gruff directness, left no room for misunderstanding. Elder Grandfeld, aware of the implications, likely understood the seriousness of Gregory's warning. With a calm assurance that bespoke his experience in handling such delicate negotiations. The terms we agreed upon will be honored. Now, please, the stone. The previously silent hooded figure, who had been standing by unobtrusively, now moved into action. With a measured and respectful gait, he advanced towards Gregory, extending his hand with a gesture of formal courtesy. Gregory, recognizing his part, reached into his attire and carefully withdrew a small stone, its size deceptive of its apparent value. With a deliberate motion, he placed the stone in the waiting hand of the hooded figure, who then carried it to his master's side. Upon receiving the stone, Elder Grandfeld's typically stoic expression gave way to a wry smile, a rare display of satisfaction and anticipation. The stone itself was a mesmerizing sight. It radiated a lustrous violet hue, shimmering with a splendor that clearly distinguished it from any ordinary rock. Within its translucent depths, intricate patterns swirled dark, mist-like formations that resembled a storm brewing within the stone's crystalline structure. Finally, I have it in my hands at last. The Valmillion Stone, he exclaimed softly, his voice tinged with awe. Curiosity peaked, Gregory eyed the Valmillion Stone and then turned his attention to Elder Grandfeld. So, what's the big deal with this stone? I tried digging up information on it, but came up empty. Even more puzzling is how you knew where to find it and what it's for. His tone was a mix of curiosity and suspicion, hinting at his interest in the stone's mysterious nature and Grandfeld's knowledge of it. Elder Grandfeld, holding the stone, glanced at Gregory with a knowing look. His response was cryptic, intentionally vague, yet laced with intrigue. Ah, Gregory, there are truths that must remain veiled for the time being. Regarding the Valmillion Stone, let's just say its true purpose will soon come to light, and its impact will be unprecedented, unlike anything witnessed since the Academy was established. The world is on the cusp of witnessing a monumental breakthrough from my research, the realization of a dream I've harbored for years. This stone will revolutionize our comprehension of what they so naively label as magic. Understanding that further inquiries would yield no more information, Gregory decided to leave the matter be. His towering figure casting a long shadow in the dimly lit room made his way to the door. He paused and turned to Grandfeld one last time. All right, Grandfeld, I'll leave things as is. But remember, you owe me for this. Don't forget your promise, he said in a tone that was both a reminder and a warning, ensuring that his contribution wouldn't go unrewarded or forgotten. With that, General Gregory, the towering figure with a demeanor as formidable as his stature, exited the room, his heavy footsteps echoing through the halls. The door closed behind him with a resonant thud, leaving Elder Grandfeld alone with the enigmatic Valmillion Stone and his grand plans that were now one step closer to fruition. Outside, under the capricious sky where the sun played a fleeting game of hide-and-seek with the clouds, sporadic droplets of rain fell, hardly any to be considered a proper downpour. A chariot made its way along the road, headed towards the grandeur of a vast kingdom. The kingdom's sprawling expanse was such that one could barely see where it ended. Young man, wake up. We've arrived, called one of the coachmen, his voice breaking through the young man's slumber. H. Huh? The young man, roused from his sleep, was momentarily disoriented. We've made it to Caladora. We're about to enter the military camp. So shake off the sleep and get ready to disembark, the coachman urged with sternness. Stirring from his laid-back position, the young man poked his head out of the chariot, his eyes widening as he took in the approaching grand structures of the kingdom. Caladora. He murmured, awestruck by the sight. Ethan couldn't help but be captivated by the beauty and majesty of the kingdom. Part 2, Chapter 9, Caledora As the chariot approached Calidora, the grandeur and scale of the kingdom gradually revealed itself to Ethan. 
since his reincarnation into this world, he had only known the confines of two places, both starkly different from the view before him. The first was his home village, a place of sentimental value, marked by its old-fashioned charm and the simplicity of rural life, at least what it once used to be. The second was the magic academy he had briefly attended, a place of learning and discovery. From the outside, Calidora appeared as a magnificent as depicted in the books he had read in his history class. Towering walls, crafted from large, meticulously carved stones, encircled the kingdom, their surfaces weathered by time yet standing firmly in place. The gates of Calidora were particularly striking, massive ironwork, they stood as both a welcoming entrance and a formidable barrier. As the chariot neared the gates, a long queue of people and other carriages could be seen, all waiting patiently for their turn to enter. However, Ethan's journey was unhindered. Accompanied by soldiers, his chariot bypassed the line. As Ethan observed the soldiers at the gates and those escorting him, a realization dawned on him. He found himself intrigued by the variety in their uniforms. Although they all served the same kingdom, subtle differences in their attire caught his attention. The primary element of their uniform, a tunic, varied in color among the soldiers. Some wore tunics of deep blue, while others were clad in hues of red, green, and brown. This diversity piqued Ethan's curiosity, as he was not yet informed to the significance behind these colors. To Ethan, it became apparent that these colors were not chosen at random nor merely for aesthetic purposes. Each color was a symbol. Thought, what exactly did they symbolize, he wondered. Atop their tunics, the soldiers were clad in lightweight breastplates designed to strike a balance between agility and protection. The design of these breastplates was such that it allowed the soldiers freedom of movement. Emblazoned on each of these breastplates was a magnificent crest, one that Ethan recognized from the books he had studied back at the academy. This emblem was more than just a decorative feature, it was a representation of the kingdom's history. Central to the design of the crest is a bold lightning bolt, a clear representation of the unique magic by the kingdom's founding sorcerer king. A symbol and statement of the unparalleled ability the founding father of this kingdom held that no other mage has been known to replicate. Encircling the lightning bolt are intricate bands filled with runes and symbols likely drawn from magical scripts. The entire crest is framed within a circular boundary, a common motif that symbolizes unity and protection. But the true meaning behind the circular frame is the statement that the kingdom is a world unto itself, complete and sovereign, with the founding sorcerer king's legacy at its very heart. Calidora Crest The soldiers, in their crisp uniforms and with an air of disciplined efficiency, guided the chariot through a separate, less congested entrance reserved for official or urgent business. Ethan caught glimpses of the soldiers at the entrance and those who had escorted him engaging in an exchange, likely confirming identities for entry into the kingdom. Oi, where'd you snatch this one from? Give you a runaround like them other brats? Nah, bend an ear this way. I snagged this lad straight out of the magic school. What? You're pulling my leg. The Imperial Academy, Lyria? Come on, quit your bluff. All them high and mighty types from there ain't never mix in with us common fold. Spill it, you found him in some backwater hamlet, yeah? No bull. I know it sounds mad, but it's the plain truth. Kid's not some lordlin, but a common plowman. Somehow got his hands on some magic and made his way into the academy. I'll be. Ain't ever heard of no dirt footer treading them fancy halls. Ain't that the sort of tale that'd be all the buzz? Thought so too, but seems like they've kept it tighter than a drum. Only got wind of it cause I pried it out of one of them student while waiting for our boy here. All right, if you're spouting the gods honest, what's got him dumped over here? Beats me. Word is, he and some other brat crossed the line with the schoolmasters and got tossed out of the school. Ethan's attention lingered on the guards' conversation, their rough voices barely a whisper among the clatter of the bustling checkpoint. Despite their casual, even irreverent tone, the information they carelessly tossed between them painted a picture of him, though he could careless about their opinions, as they were ignorant of the true facts. Reckon he's in for a rough patch now, the first soldier continued, scratching at his stubble. 
Doubt the officers there will cotton to him too kindly. They've got no love for the cushy life them noble mages live. If they catch wind of his past, uff, they'll ride him hard. True enough, the second soldier grunted, a smirk playing on his lips. Ethan felt a twinge of discomfort. Ride me hard, he thought, he shifted uneasily, the weight of their stares reminding him he was still an outsider here. The second soldier leaned in closer, his voice dropping to a hushed, grave tone. Anyway, have you caught wind of that village not far from here? The whole place got butchered overnight by some dark creatures. The first soldier's jesting demeanor vanished, replaced by a flicker of concern. Massacred, you say? Creatures from the shadows, hereabouts? Aye, the second soldier replied, his eyes scanning their surroundings as if the mere mention might summon such horrors. Thornfield Village, just beyond the eastern ridge. They say not a soul was left breathing. Walls breached and houses burned to the ground. Ethan's hands clenched involuntarily, the knuckles whitening as the conversation of the soldiers seeped into his ears, each word a hammer blow to his chest. Thornfield Village The name echoed through his mind, a haunting refrain that brought with it images of warm smiles and familiar faces now lost to an unimaginable darkness. The soldiers' words, laden with a distant concern for a village they did not know, ignited a storm of grief and anger within Ethan. The abrupt shout from behind jolted Ethan and the soldiers from their conversation. Hey! What are you guys blabbering about? We don't have all day. Get a move on, barked a voice from another chariot, its driver clearly impatient with the delay at the entrance. Aye. Calm your neck, you mule, retorted the first soldier, throwing a dismissive hand up but nudging the chariot forward. His companion chuckled, the tension of their earlier discussion dissipating like mist. Let's grab a pint later, I've got to drop this lad off at the camp, the second soldier said, giving Ethan a sidelong glance. Aye, that we will, agreed the first soldier as they both guided the chariot through the entrance. Ethan sat quietly, the conversation about Thornfield and the soldier's plans to drink later swirling in his head, a bitter reminder of the normalcy that continued around him while his world crumbled. He felt a deep sense of isolation, surrounded by individuals who would soon forget the village's name as easily as they shook off the dust from their boots. As the chariot continued on, Ethan's gaze drifted to view beyond the gate. The interior of the kingdom unveiled itself like the opening pages of a new and unexplored book. The streets were lined with cobblestones, worn smooth by the passage of countless feet and wheels, leading deeper into the heart of the kingdom. To the sides, buildings rose in an array of architectural styles. Some structures boasted tall, pointed roofs, while others were adorned with rounded arches and intricate stonework. The air was filled with the mixed scents of open-air markets, where vendors hawked their wares, from exotic spices to rare textiles, their stalls a riot of color and noise. The calls of merchants mingled with the laughter of children playing in the streets and the clatter of blacksmiths plying their trade. The hustle were indicative of a thriving kingdom, with each citizen contributing to the tapestry of daily life. Throughout the kingdom, the presence of magic was palpable. Street lamps glowed with a steady, enchanting light. Here and there, street performers gathered crowds, their hands weaving spells that sent orbs of light dancing in the air or conjured miniature creature out of water that elicited delighted gasps from children and adults. Ethan's gaze, however, was drawn to the majestic structure that dominated the cityscape, the royal palace. It stood resolute at the city's core, its presence felt from every corner of Caladora. The palace rose with an elegance that defied its massive scale, each tower capped with gilded roofs, a display of brilliance. Despite the turmoil within him, Ethan couldn't help but be captivated by the sight. The chariot rolled on, navigating through the animated streets of Caladora, each turn and cobblestone bringing Ethan ever closer to the military camp. Part 2, Chapter 10, The New Recruit Halt, commanded a soldier standing guard at the entrance of the military camp. His voice, firm and authoritative, cut through the air as Ethan's chariot came to a stop. This was the final destination of a journey that had begun in turmoil and uncertainty. The camp itself was a sprawling expanse of organized activity and disciplined routine. 
Unlike the vibrant and magical heart of the academy, the camp was a testament to martial efficiency and order. Tents and barracks were arranged in meticulous rows, each one identical to the next, creating a sense of uniformity and purpose. The central grounds were open and vast, serving as a training area where soldiers drilled in various forms of combat under the watchful eyes of their superiors. Flags bearing the kingdom's crest fluttered atop poles, marking the boundaries of the camp. The air was filled with the sounds of metal clashing against metal, the grunts of soldiers sparring, and the occasional bark of orders from the officers. Practice dummies and targets were scattered throughout, each bearing the marks of rigorous training exercises. So this is my new home now. Ethan stepped off the chariot, his eyes taking in the disciplined world he was about to enter. The atmosphere was charged with a tangible sense of duty, a far cry from the academic halls he had left behind. Here, knowledge was measured in strength and skill, and survival depended on quick reflexes and strategic thinking rather than one's magical aptitude. The soldier guarding the camp approached the chariot. His gaze shifted between Ethan and the soldier who had escorted him, assessing the situation with a practiced eye. State your business, the guard demanded, his voice carrying an edge of command. The escorting soldier stepped forward, offering a crisp salute. Sir, I've brought this recruit from the academy, as per the orders. He's to be integrated into the training program immediately. The guard's eyes narrowed slightly as he appraised Ethan. From the academy, you say? Not the usual sort we get around here. His tone was skeptical but not dismissive. He understood that the academy, with its focus on magic and scholarly pursuits, was a world apart from the gritty realities of military life. Yes, sir. But he's no ordinary academy lad. He ain't your noble child, he's dirt-born just like us, the escorting soldier added, emphasizing Ethan's humble origins. The guard's expression softened slightly, a glimmer of intrigue flashing in his eyes. Dirt-born, eh, he muttered, reassessing Ethan. This revelation seemed to bridge a gap, as if Ethan's humble beginnings were a point of connection in this world where lineage often dictated one's path. That's right, sir. He's one of the folk, made it to the academy on his own medal, is what I heard. But now, he's here to serve just like any other, the escort affirmed. The guard's grunt conveyed an ambiguity that left Ethan unsure whether it was a sign of approval or disapproval. Well, that's a first, he remarked with a skeptical tone. We'll see how the academy training holds up in the field. If those scholarly pampered nobles are as good as they let on to be, you'll find your place here soon enough, though I doubt that would be the case. This isn't your bookworm kind of place. His words carried a hint of challenge, as if he was both questioning and gauging Ethan's ability to adapt to the starkly different demands of military life compared to the scholarly environment of the academy. Ethan absorbed the guard's skepticism, understanding that the Academy's prestige and his achievements there would carry little weight in the face of the raw, physical demands and the pragmatic discipline of the military camp. As they walked, the guard led Ethan past rows of tents and training grounds, where the air was thick with the sounds of orders being shouted and weapons clashing. This is where you'll be trained. Forget what you know about magic and books. Here, it's about strength, endurance, and the will to live against sure death. You'll start with the basics and work your way up, just like everyone else, the guard explained, his tone firm but not unkind. The guard led Ethan towards a series of tents set up within the camp, each one seemingly identical to the next in its simple, functional design. He stopped in front of one and pulled back the flap, gesturing for Ethan to enter. This will be your quarters. You'll be bunking here with three other recruits. They're your team now, in training and, if, when it comes to it, in war. Best get to know them quickly. War, huh? Guess it's something I couldn't avoid after all, no matter how hard I tried. Ethan thought to himself, coming to terms with the fact that despite his efforts to steer clear of conflict, it was something he was bound to face eventually. Ethan stepped inside the tent, finding it sparsely furnished with four cots, a small table, and a few wooden chests for personal belongings. It was a far cry from the quarters he was accustomed to at the academy. 
Inside, three young men, who appeared to be around Ethan's age, looked up from their various activities. One was polishing a sword, another was studying a map, and the third was resting. Their expressions ranged from curiosity to indifference upon seeing Ethan, but there was a shared acknowledgement in their eyes. They were all in this new chapter together. The guard spoke again, his tone more instructive now. Unpack your baggage and settle in. You will receive further instructions soon. Remember, these men are your team. Trust and cooperation aren't just virtues here, they're necessities. Learn to work together, and you'll stand a chance out there. With that, the guard left, leaving Ethan to acquaint himself with his new surroundings and comrades. Ethan carefully unpacked his limited possessions. As he transferred his items into the chest assigned to him, he came across the book given to him by Mr. Alfred, nestled at the bottom of his bag. Pausing for a moment, he delicately wrapped the book in a piece of cloth, handling it with a reverence that spoke of its importance to him. He then gently placed it in a secluded corner of the chest, ensuring it was safely tucked away without being seen by the others in the tent. But it was his final item that drew the most attention. As he took it out, Ethan could sense the inquisitive eyes of his new tent mates on him. Hey, what's that you're holding? I've never seen a sword like that before, asked one of the young men, briefly pausing in his sword sharpening task to look up at Ethan. Ethan held the item up for them to see. It wasn't a conventional sword by any means, its design and make were unique, setting it apart from the standard military issue weapons. The curiosity in the tent was palpable, a shared moment of interest in something that broke the monotony of their standard equipment and belongings. This is a weapon I built for my personal use. It's called an umbrella, Ethan explained, holding the unique item with a sense of pride, yet choosing to keep its magical nature to himself for now. He was aware that revealing his background and the true capabilities of the umbrella might change the way his tentmates perceived him. At this early stage, he preferred to establish a relationship based on who he was as a person, rather than the labels or titles associated with his past. As he carefully placed the umbrella with the rest of his belongings, Ethan could sense the curiosity in the tent rising. His tentmates exchanged glances, their expressions a mix of intrigue and bemusement. An umbrella, huh? That's a first. Never thought I'd see someone bring such unique-looking item into a military camp, one of the recruits remarked, a hint of amusement in his voice. Ethan offered a small, knowing smile, but didn't elaborate further. My name is Ethan. I'll be in your care. Ethan turned to his tentmates, offering a sincere and approachable expression. His words were simple, but carried the weight of his intent of mutual support. His introduction was met with nods. The atmosphere in the tent, initially filled with curiosity and reserve, began to shift towards a sense of budding camaraderie. The three other tentmates, each with their own unique background and personality, introduced themselves to Ethan in turn. The first, the young man who had been sharpening his sword earlier, extended his greeting. Name's Lucas, an aspiring knight, he said. Next was the one who had been studying the map. He looked up pushing a lock of hair from his forehead, and offered a more reserved smile. I'm Julian. I have a knack for strategy and planning. Hopefully, we can learn a thing or two from each other. Finally, the third recruit, who had been lounging on his back, looked up at Ethan and offered a casual nod. Name's Max, he said, his tone direct and no-nonsense. I'm the type who likes to get straight to the point. We're here to pull our weight and get things done. His words carried an air of resolve, although his relaxed posture at that moment amusingly contradicted his statement about diligence. Ethan listened attentively, mentally noting each name, setting the stage for the dynamic that would develop among them. Part 2, Chapter 11's Factions So, what do you guys think they'll have us do first? Max asked casually, absent-mindedly poking his nose with his pinky finger. Julian, pushing a lock of hair out of his eyes, turned to address Max's question. Typically, new recruits have to undergo physical training for the first three months. I heard it's pretty rigorous. After that, they usually assign us to specific faction based on their needs. Ethan listened intently, absorbing this new information. 
Ethan's interest peaked as Julian mentioned the assignment of recruits to specific factions. Lucas, equally intrigued, leaned forward. Factions? That's the first I've heard of that. What are those? Julian nodded, ready to explain. After the initial training period, soldiers are assigned to one of four factions. Each faction is represented by a color and aligns with a particular element. They determine your role and duties in the kingdom's military. As Ethan reflected on Julian's explanation of the factions, a realization dawned on him. He remembered the soldiers he had seen earlier, each wearing a tunic of a different color, deep blue, red, green, and brown. It clicked in his mind that these colors corresponded to the factions Julian had mentioned. The varied hues of the tunics were not merely for distinction or decoration, they symbolized the specific roles and specialties of each soldier within the kingdom's military. First, there's the blue faction, Julian continued, also known as the water faction. They're primarily medics. The water element is associated with healing and restoration, so these soldiers are trained in medical skills and battlefield triage. Then we have the green faction, aligned with the wind element, he added. These soldiers are scouts and reconnaissance experts. They're fast, agile, and adept at gathering intelligence and navigating challenging terrains. Lucas nodded, absorbing the information, but it was Max who spoke next, curiosity in his voice. What about the brown faction? Julian shifted slightly. The brown faction, linked to the earth element, are the protectors. They're tasked with defending the kingdom, manning fortifications, and ensuring the safety of our borders. Ethan listened intently, trying to imagine where he might fit into this structure. His thoughts were interrupted as Julian's tone grew more somber. And finally, there's the red faction associated with the fire element. This is the group most soldiers hope to avoid. They're assigned the most dangerous tasks, frontline combat, war missions, and expeditions against dark creatures. It's high risk without the luxury of high reward. As Julian finished explaining about the red faction, Lucas's eyes lit up. That's exactly what I'm aiming for, he exclaimed, his enthusiasm palpable. As an aspiring knight, facing the toughest challenges is the best way to prove myself. The red faction sounds like where the real action is. Max, reclining back, raised an eyebrow at Lucas's eagerness. You're keen on jumping into the fire, huh? Well, as for me, I prefer the brown faction. Staying within the kingdom's walls, guarding the fort, sounds like a steady job. Less about charging into danger and more about keeping steady watch. Seems like the easiest task if you ask me. Julian, who had been listening thoughtfully, chimed in. I'd lean towards the blue faction, personally. I think I'm pretty quick at picking up new skills, and I'm handy with details. Learning medical and first aid skills could be really useful. Plus, helping others directly like that, it's appealing. Though, I have a preference for strategy and planning, it's unfortunate there isn't a specific faction dedicated to those skills. The conversation turned to Ethan, all eyes on him as they waited for his preference. Ethan hesitated, unsure where he fit in this spectrum of roles. Before he could articulate his thoughts, Julian interjected, noting his silence. In the end, it might not matter much what we want, Julian pointed out pragmatically. We're not usually given a choice in the selection. And since we're a team now, we'll likely all end up in the same faction. It's about where they need us most as a unit, not just as individuals. The idea of being placed in a faction based on the needs of the military, rather than personal preference, was sobering. It brought home the fact that they were part of a larger system, one where individual desires were secondary to the collective needs and strategies of the kingdom's defense. Their conversation was abruptly interrupted as the flap of the tent swung open, revealing the soldier who had brought Ethan to the camp. His expression was stern and businesslike, a clear indication that the time for casual talk was over. All right, you four, on your feet, he commanded briskly. Follow me. It's time for your orientation. The four recruits exchanged quick glances, the weight of the moment settling upon them. They stood up almost in unison, each mentally bracing themselves for what was to come. 
they stepped out of the tent and fell into line behind the soldier, who led them towards the central part of the camp. The sounds of the camp's activities grew louder as they approached. The group reached the training grounds, a vast expanse filled with rows upon rows of cadets, all standing in disciplined, orderly fashion. Each group appeared to be a team, similar to Ethan and his companions, marked by their identical stances and focused expressions. The soldier leading them spoke over his shoulder. Pay attention to everything you're told and show respect to your superiors. How you perform in these next months determines a lot about your future here. Make it count. Their escorting soldier led Ethan and his team to a specific location within the training ground. He pointed to a spot, his expression stern. Stand here and don't move an inch. Stay quiet, he instructed in a no-nonsense tone. The person in charge of the camp will address all of you shortly. I expect you to listen attentively and show the utmost respect. Any lack of courtesy will not be tolerated. Ethan and his teammates nodded in acknowledgement and took their places, standing side by side. They looked around, taking in the sea of faces, all new recruits like themselves. They couldn't help but observe the array of expressions on the faces around them. Anxiety, uncertainty, and even fear were evident in many of the young recruits' eyes. Some looked around nervously, trying to mask their apprehension, while a few were barely holding back tears. It became increasingly clear to Ethan that many, if not most, of these recruits were here not by choice, but due to the kingdom's enforced military conscription law. They were young men and women plucked from their previous lives and thrust into this new, daunting one. The training ground fell into a hush as a figure of authority, presumably the person in charge of the camp, stepped forward. This individual carried an air of command, and their presence demanded attention. He was of medium height, but carried himself with an imposing presence that made him seem larger. His posture was upright and confident. His eyes were sharp and piercing, scanning the crowd of recruits with a gaze that seemed to take in everything and miss nothing. His hair was cropped short, a practical style that matched the no-nonsense demeanor he projected. He wore a uniform that set him apart from the standard military attire around the camp. While it maintained the authoritative design befitting his rank, the uniform had a distinctive shade that edged closer to red. This detail caught the attention of Ethan, leading him to a realization this man was most likely a member feared red faction. Indicating his involvement in the most challenging and perilous faction the kingdom's military offered. It suggested a career marked by frontline engagements, strategic warfare, and perhaps direct encounters with dark creatures, the very tasks that defined the Red Faction's reputation. As he stood before the assembled recruits, all sensed that he was not just a leader by rank, but a leader by respect earned through years of dedication and sacrifice. The authoritative figure cleared his throat, capturing the full attention of the recruits. In a voice that resonated across the training ground, he began, I am Commander Alden, and I welcome you all as the newest recruits of Caladora's military. Part 2, Chapter 12, So Be It. Commander Alden proceeded to walk slowly across the front of the assembled recruits, his gaze methodically sweeping over them. You were all brought here to become more than just soldiers. You are here to become defenders of Caladora, protectors of our people and our way of life. His eyes swept across the sea of young faces, some marred by confusion, others shadowed by fear. I see the uncertainty, the fear, and the anxiety in your eyes. Life, as you will learn, is fraught with such challenges. Do not harbor resentment towards your country, which strives tirelessly for your safety. Direct your anger towards the malevolent forces that threaten our existence, the enemies that have plagued us for generations. Yes, you were conscripted, some of you against your will, so what? The time has come for you to repay the sanctuary you've been granted all these years, to rise and safeguard the future generations. Only through such resolve can we hope to shield ourselves and eventually obliterate those fiends that seek our downfall. He paused for effect, allowing his words to sink in. Ethan stood silently among the rows of recruits, his expression betraying nothing of the turmoil that stirred within him. As Commander Alden's words rang out, firm and resolute, they struck a dissonant chord in Ethan's mind. 
Bullshit, he thought, a silent rebuttal to the commander's attempt at an impelling speech. To him, the rhetoric of glory and duty couldn't mask the stark reality that many of them were here not by choice, but by force. His eyes flickered across the faces of his fellow recruits, wondering if any shared his sentiments. Were they all buying into this grand narrative? Or were there others who, like him, felt the weight of being uprooted from their lives and thrust into a role they hadn't asked for? Yet, despite his inner conflict, Ethan understood the necessity of the situation. The kingdom was under threat, and every young able-bodied individual was expected to contribute to its defense. It was a harsh truth, one that left little room for personal grievances. The training you will undergo is designed to test you, to push you, and ultimately, to forge you into the warriors our kingdom needs. You will be challenged physically and mentally. You will learn the basic art of combat, the values of discipline and teamwork. Some of you may find your limits, others may discover strengths you never knew you had. The idea of being molded into a defender of the kingdom was daunting since just a few days ago he was being molded to be a mage. He paused, letting his gaze sweep over the recruits. Understand this, we provide the tools for success, but ultimately, it's your individual effort that will determine your survival. Take my word seriously. Work diligently and with purpose. The lack of commitment is not just failure. In our world, it can mean death. The commander wasn't just outlining the training program, he was laying bare the harsh reality of their situation. Commander Alden's concluding remarks carried an air of finality, but as his sweeping gaze passed over the recruits, it lingered momentarily on Ethan. He scrutinized him from head to toe, and a brief, knowing smirk crossed his face. Though, I do believe this batch of recruits might show us something interesting, he remarked, his eyes still fixed on Ethan. There was a hint of intrigue in his tone, suggesting he was aware of something that set Ethan apart from the rest. Ethan felt a surge of awareness at that moment. The commander's gaze, coupled with his cryptic comment, made it clear that he was aware of Ethan's background as a former academy student. It was a silent acknowledgement that Ethan's journey here was not just another story among many, but one that had perhaps caught the commander's attention. After Commander Alden departed, another man stepped forward to take the center stage. He had a less imposing presence than Alden, but his demeanor was just as serious and authoritative. He began to outline the program that the recruits would be following over the next few weeks. First and foremost, we will focus on building your physical strength and stamina, he announced, his voice clear and resonant. This will include rigorous routines like long-distance running, obstacle courses, and various bodyweight exercises. Our goal is to get you in peak physical condition. A soldier's body must be a well-tuned instrument, capable of enduring the demands of prolonged battle. He paused for a moment to let his words sink in, then continued. The next phase of your training will involve weapon mastery. You will receive basic training in handling the weapon of your choice, from swords and bows to spears and shields. This is not just about learning to swing a blade or notch an arrow, it's about understanding the mechanics, the balance, and the discipline of wielding a weapon. Every soldier must be somewhat proficient in these fundamental skills. As the recruits listened intently, the instructor's expression turned somewhat enigmatic. And finally, the last part of your initial training. Well, let's just say that we'll cross that bridge when we get there. It's a crucial aspect of your development as soldiers, but for now, focus on the immediate tasks at hand. The recruits exchanged glances, curiosity, and a hint of apprehension evident in their expressions. As soon as the instructor finished outlining the training program, he wasted no time in letting the recruits know that their rigorous journey would begin immediately. Listen up, he barked, his voice cutting through the morning chill. Your training starts now, on your very first day. No time for dawdling. Line up for the morning run. The recruits quickly scrambled into formation, their faces reflecting apprehension. Ethan found himself alongside Lucas, Julian, and Max. Guess we're diving right in. Max muttered to them, trying to sound more confident than he felt. Better than sitting around waiting. Lucas replied, cracking his knuckles. With a sharp command, the recruits began to run. 
The course took them along a rugged trail that skirted the edges of the camp. The ground was uneven, dotted with rocks and roots that demanded careful attention to avoid tripping. Ethan focused on his breathing, trying to find a steady rhythm amid the jostling of bodies and the instructor's relentless pace. He could hear the heavy breathing and pounding footsteps of his peers, an exertion that filled the air. You call that running? My grandmother moves faster, the instructor yelled, jogging effortlessly alongside the recruits. His gaze was piercing, seemingly evaluating each recruit's stamina and determination. The trail wound its way through a small wooded area. Ethan felt his legs starting to burn, his chest heaving for air, but he pushed on. As they emerged from the woods, the camp came back into view, the end of the circuit approaching. Final stretch. Give it everything you've got, the instructor bellowed. The recruits' heart hammered in their chest, their breath coming in ragged gasps. Their faces etched with effort. They crossed the finish line back at the starting point, a collective sigh of relief and exhaustion escaping from the group. Ethan bent over, hands on his knees, trying to catch his breath. The instructor nodded, a slight hint of approval in his eyes. Not bad for your first run. But don't get comfortable. Every day, you'll push harder. Now, let's move on to the next exercise. Ethan and his fellow recruits, already gasping for breath and drenched in sweat, exchanged weary glances. The realization of what lay ahead in the coming weeks began to sink in. The physical exertion from the run alone had sapped much of their energy, and the thought of continuing with more exercises was overwhelming. Max leaned over, hands on his knees, and muttered, How are we supposed to keep going? I'm already spent. Julian, trying to catch his breath, managed a wry smile. Welcome to military training, I guess. Lucas, wiping sweat from his brow, added quietly, It's not just our bodies they're training. It's our willpower, our resilience. This is how knights are made. Ethan lay on the ground, catching his breath after the intense workout. The physical exertion had a surprisingly clarifying effect on his mind. As his body pushed through the fatigue, his mind found a moment of peace, free from the whirlwind of worries and doubts that had plagued him. It was during this brief respite that Ethan came to a pivotal realization and acceptance of his current situation. He acknowledged the harsh reality of his conscription, understanding that resistance was futile and perhaps even counterproductive. Yet, beneath his acceptance, a current of skepticism flowed. The doubts about the diagnosis of his magical abilities, or the supposed disability in his mana veins, lingered in his thoughts. I've manipulated magic in ways others haven't even considered. Ethan thought, his mind racing with possibilities. My unconventional approach to magic, my understanding of the elements, especially whether, it's not something many at my age could achieve. Does this not prove that the limitations they've placed on me are based on their own lack of knowledge? A determination began to take root in Ethan's mind. He refused to accept the verdict that had been passed on him without question. If they're right, and I do have mana atrophy, then I'll find a cure. I won't let this be the end of my journey with magic. And I certainly won't resign myself to being a mere pawn, a meat shield for others without using every tool at my disposal. Lying there on the ground, gathering his strength, Ethan experienced a profound moment of clarity. It was as if the intense physical exertion had stripped away the surface layers of his thoughts, revealing a deeper truth within. He realized what truly defined a great mage, a scholar, a seeker of knowledge and truth. It was the fundamental characteristic of a seeker, to doubt. Doubt, and keep doubting, until the true answer is revealed. Question everything, because nothing in this world is beyond questioning. Seek relentlessly, because nothing in this world is beyond the reach of inquiry and understanding. His unconventional approach to magic, his ability to think outside the norms and constraints of traditional magical teachings, had always been driven by this inherent curiosity and skepticism. Ethan rose from the ground. In his heart and mind, he also committed to continuing his quest for magical knowledge. Since he was forced to become a soldier, so be it. Ethan recognized that this dual role was not just a compromise, but an opportunity. 
As a soldier, he would gain strength, discipline, and a deeper understanding of the world from a perspective he had never considered. As a scholar and a seeker of magic, he would continue to explore the mysteries of the arcane, to push the boundaries of what was known and accepted. I'll do both. I'll be a soldier and also keep learning, like a scholar. I'll protect others and keep searching for answers. Once I can free myself of others' choices in regard to my own life, that's when I'll really understand what I'm here for in this life. Part 2 Chapter 13 Introduction to Magical Theory 2 Chapter 2 After the demanding run, the recruits faced a grueling series of bodyweight exercises. Push-ups, sit-ups, and squats tested their endurance, pushing everyone to the brink of their physical capabilities. Ethan's muscles burned with the intensity of the workout, each repetition a battle against his own limits. Yet, he welcomed the challenge, understanding that this pain was a crucial part of forging independence and resilience. The day's rigorous activities culminated in a lecture emphasizing the core values of discipline, teamwork, and perseverance. The instructor's words served as a reminder of the mental fortitude required alongside physical strength. Following the lecture, the recruits were led to the dining hall for their evening meal. The food, though far from appealing in appearance or taste, was designed to mimic the rations one might expect on expeditions. It was nutritious, if not gourmet, providing the essential energy needed without any frills. The meal was a practical lesson in itself, preparing them for the realities of life in the field. After dinner, the recruits were granted two hours of free time before they had to go to bed. However, given the day's exhaustive training, Ethan and his teammates found little energy to enjoy this brief respite. Instead, they opted to return to their tent early. The physical and mental exertion of the day weighed heavily on them all. While his comrades succumbed to sleep almost instantly upon touching their cots, exhaustion claiming them effortlessly, Ethan found himself in a different state. Despite the physical toll the day had taken on him, his mind had other plans, unable to succumb to rest so easily. There was a determination within him, a burning question that refused to let him rest. Quietly, with careful movements not to disturb the others, Ethan rose from his cot and moved towards his storage chest. There, nestled among his few possessions, lay the book given to him by Mr. Alfred. Introduction to Magic Theory 2 Ethan read out under his breath. Under the night, barely enough to see, Ethan used his blanket as a makeshift cover to hide his actions from the group, though everyone else was deep in sleep. With a deep focus, he summoned a tiny flame atop his index finger. The flame was minuscule, emitting a gentle glow that illuminated the pages of the book without the risk of burning anything or drawing the attention of his deeply sleeping comrades. Even though the magical flame Ethan conjured was minuscule, a faint sensation of pain flickered through his body, reminiscent of a persistent pinch. This discomfort, though mild, served as a constant reminder of the limitations he faced. Ethan understood all too well that this sensation was merely the precursor to what would be an exponential increase in pain should he dare to amplify his magical output. It was precisely this reason that he had been warned against attempting to harness anything beyond the most basic level of magic. The agony that would ensue from more significant spells was deemed too severe for him to bear. This realization was both a constraint and a catalyst for Ethan. Each minor twinge of pain with his small flame underscored the reality of his condition, yet it also fueled his determination to seek a way beyond it. The very fact that he could manifest even this tiny flame was proof of his connection to magic, a connection he was not yet willing to sever or surrender to the dictates of his supposed limitations. Under the sanctuary of his blanket, with the tiny magical flame casting a gentle light on the pages, Ethan found himself revisiting familiar territory within the book. The initial chapter, which he had thoroughly covered during his time at the academy under Professor Evelyn's tutelage, delved into the intricacies of multitasking and magical practice. Having already mastered the concepts and applications of this initial lesson, Ethan felt no need to linger on the pages he knew by now. With a determined flick of his wrist, Ethan turned the pages, moving past the foundational teachings to the next segment of his magical education, Magical Sensitivity. Chapter 2, Magical Sensitivity Page 12 
As we delve further into the mystical world of magic, our focus shifts to the essential concept of magical sensitivity. This ability is paramount for those who wish to not just perform magic, but to truly connect with and understand the subtle energies that are defined within us. 2.1 The Essence of Sensitivity at the core of magical sensitivity lies the ability to perceive and interact with the magical essence that suffuses our being. This essence, also referred to as mana, is the bedrock of all magical phenomena. While the notion of such essence is no longer a foreign concept at this juncture, your current understanding and use of mana merely scratch the surface of a much deeper and expansive concept. Sensitivity to magic what does it truly entail, and how does it expand upon the initial lessons of basic mana manipulation? For any practitioner of magic, cultivating a sharp awareness of this omnipresent sensation is crucial to their craft. It's this heightened sensitivity that allows one to detect the subtle shifts and intricate patterns of magical energy flowing within themselves. This is not merely an extension of the basic manipulation of mana, but a deeper, more intimate connection with the very currents of magic that course through the self. 2.2 Attunement Achieving attunement with the magical essence requires more than just passive observation. It demands an active engagement with the energy flows around and within oneself. This process involves fine-tuning one's own energy to resonate with the ambient magical essence. Practices such as focused meditation, deep concentration, and the cultivation of inner stillness are vital for enhancing one's magical sensitivity. Through these methods, a practitioner learns to quiet the noise of the physical world, allowing them to sense the subtle whispers of magic that permeate their surroundings. 2.3 Interpreting Magical Signatures Every magical entity and phenomenon possesses a unique signature, a distinctive pattern of energy that can be read and interpreted by those with heightened magical sensitivity. Understanding these signatures is akin to learning the language of magic itself. By recognizing and interpreting the various energy signatures encountered, a practitioner can identify the types of magic at play, the intentions behind magical constructs, and even the presence of magical creatures or artifacts. This insight opens up a new dimension of interaction with the magical world, enabling more nuanced and effective spellcasting unique to them, placing your own signature into the realm of magic. Turn the page to embark on the explanation and exercises that will lead you into a deeper connection with the world of magic through the lens of magical sensitivity. Ethan, intrigued by the potential knowledge that could aid him, he eagerly turned to the section titled 2.1 The Essence of Sensitivity. Under the dim glow of his magical flame, he began to read, absorbing every word with keen interest. 2.1 The Essence of Sensitivity Introduction The ability to perceive, interact with, and influence the subtle energies that permeate within. For a practitioner of magic, developing this sensitivity is not just beneficial, it is essential. It allows for a deeper connection with the magical forces at play, enhancing every aspect of spellcasting and magical understanding. The essence of sensitivity operates on the principle of resonance between a practitioner's active mana manipulation and the latent mana that often remain untapped. Imagine a musician attempting to play a finely crafted instrument without first tuning it. They might hit the correct notes, believing they're producing beautiful music. However, once they tuned their instrument correctly, they realized the music's true potential was never fully unleashed. Similarly, a mage's body is akin to an instrument, and tuning one's senses to the magical essence within is crucial. This alignment enables a mage to instinctively perceive and interact with magical currents, energies, and entities, unlocking a richer, more nuanced understanding and control of magic. To truly understand magical sensitivity, one must first acknowledge what they lack, only they would know of it. By recognizing this lacking presence, a practitioner can begin to attune their senses to the subtle vibrations of magic that are otherwise unnoticed by the untrained mind. How to Practice It The practice of enhancing magical sensitivity starts with mindfulness and meditation. Begin by finding a quiet space where you can sit undisturbed. Close your eyes and focus on your breathing, letting go of all external concerns. Gradually shift your attention to the flow of mana, attempting to feel its presence. It may start as a vague sensation, but with time and practice, these sensations will become more distinct. 
everyone's connection to mana varies. Some may already be in tune, needing little adjustment, while others may require significant attunement to harmonize their internal mana's flow. It's like discovering an untuned string on your instrument. Your goal is to reattach and tune this string, integrating it to enhance your magical capacity. Practice daily, paying attention to the subtleties of mana within, and adjust as necessary to ensure every part of you resonates with the mana that governs your existence. Intrigued by the introduction to magical sensitivity, Ethan felt a spark of excitement at the prospect of exploring this essential aspect of magic. The idea of attuning his senses to the subtle vibrations of magic, of interpreting the unique signatures that each spell or magical entity possessed, was exactly the kind of knowledge Ethan believed could further his quest to overcome his limitations. However, as he absorbed the words, the day's exertions began to weigh heavily on him. The physical toll of the training, combined with the mental strain, had left him drained. Recognizing the importance of rest in his rigorous schedule, Ethan reluctantly marked his place in the book and closed it gently. He placed the book back into his storage chest with a sense of reverence, acknowledging that the journey into magical sensitivity was one he would have to postpone until the next night. He knew he required a level of focus and energy that he simply couldn't muster at the moment. As he settled back onto his cot, Ethan made a silent promise to himself to begin his exploration of the essence of sensitivity the following night. For now, rest was paramount. Allowing his body and mind to recover from the day's challenges was essential if he was to continue pushing his boundaries, both as a soldier and as a seeker of magical knowledge. With that final thought, Ethan allowed himself to drift off to sleep, the day's exhaustion quickly pulling him into a deep slumber. His commitment to pursuing his dual path remained unwavering, but for tonight, the quest for understanding would have to wait. 